think we're fine. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks uh, for being here. Uh, it's a kind of minor miracle that we're here <laughs> at all, given that we had to move in this event because of our own strikes. Uh, and then, of course, today there are other strikes, like train strikes. So if any of you have traveled here today, I can, you know, congratulations. We're very, <laughs> we're very pleased to see uh, a good crowd. Um, and uh, I'm a member of the CIRN, the CERN committee, the Cambridge Italian Research Network. My name's Robert Gordon, and I work over there in modern languages here. Um, and so I am just saying welcome and explaining in, like, 60 seconds uh, how we got uh, to this event today uh, and then Gianmarco is going to take over who is running and convening as you all know this uh, amazing event with this stunning visual uh, uh, accompaniment. Um, so yeah, we're here because uh, the network that we run, me, Melissa uh, and Mary, Melissa Perez and Mary Laban there and Damien Pollard if he were here, uh, we run this network, we started collaborating with Crash the Cambridge, no, the, the Centre for the Research in Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, which is over the corridor here uh, in uh, Cambridge Centre for Interdisciplinary Research. And we were very fortunate to receive some funding from uh, Italy, the Intesa San Paolo Bank has very generously uh, funded some activities in and around research uh, in Italian in Cambridge. And one of the ways we use this research in the network was to launch a visiting fellowship programme. So Gianmarco is the second uh, CERN crash in Tesa San Paolo <laughs> visiting fellow uh, uh, who has spent a term, this, uh, this term in Cambridge, working on his own uh, research, but also organising and building towards this event. Uh, we had the first of these last year. Uh, if I remember rightly, the title of that was From the Black Mediterranean to the Black Atlantic. Or something uh... like other way around. Other way around, to the Black Mediterranean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, migrations are complex. Um, um, so, uh, with Vera Schultz, who was a, a, an art historian based in Florence, and she similarly spent a term here. So we're on a kind of uh, themed run of what we hope will be at least three um, fellowships, uh, three events like this, all broadly around issues of uh, what we call diverse Italy, but somehow sort of stretching the, the boundaries of Italy uh, and mobilities in, beyond and around it. So, uh, we're delighted to have Gianmarco here all term, uh, in, engaging with us, helping us run other events, talking to our students. Uh, so it's been fabulous to have you here, Gianmarco, thank you very much. Um, and I think with that, I'll just leave the floor to Gianmarco to launch the event yeah. and say uh, how it's going to run today. Thank so you. thanks very much. Thank you. So, buongiorno a tutti e a tutte, good morning everyone, it's a real pleasure for me being here as the organizer of Italy's Imperial Debris and we, have, we are going to have a very intense and rich day, so I'm going to steal just a couple of minutes to introduce the idea behind this, this symposium. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just looking at this picture, and I chose this picture for like several reasons, but uh, we, let's get back to time and space. We are in March 1937. We are in Libya, the Mediterranean shore of Libya. At the time, Libya was an Italian colony. At the center of the image, we see here Benito Mussolini visiting the ruins of the city of Sabrata, which 2,000 years ago was one of the most significant African Mediterranean cities in the Roman Empire. And uh, the political meanings of this picture is crystal clear. Mussolini walks over the ruins of the ancient city, thus materializing the connection between the ancient Roman Empire and the new imperial Italy. And for this reason, I thought this is the most appropriate image to encapsulate the themes that will be discussed uh, by our brilliant speakers. Thank you for having accepted my invitation. However, the idea of the continuity between the modern, uh, let's say, ancient and modern imperial formations blatantly pervaded not only the Italian colonial discourse, yet also the whole Eurocentric idea of modern expansionism. It was, in other words, a trans-imperial discourse. In particular, the Roman Empire 
provided a reference point for the political, juridical, cultural elaboration of modern forms of imperialism and as a photographic negative of nation building. I can mention here the fundamental work by Anthony Pagan, the burdens of empire, but also from a more critical post-colonial perspective, white mythologies by Robert Young, putting the classic culture as a kind of uh, shared uh, discourse underpinning also British and French imperialism, for instance, modern imperialism. In this regard, although the today's symposium centers on Italy, it's intrinsically open to further transnational comparison and dialogue. But in Italy, the presence and popularity of classical ruins has tended to dominate artistic and literary representation from the Middle Ages up to 19th century. And for a more, let's say, political standpoint, the discourse intersected with the national reunification process, the Risorgimento. The position of modern Italy within a history that originates from the Roman Empire and which led to modern colonialism went hand in hand with the definition of the legal and racial borders of the national community, as well as with the assertion of its prime role in the Mediterranean Sea. So this rhetoric characterized the description of colonial undertakings in Libya and in the Northern of Africa, like since the end of the 19th century to the mid 20th century. And the remains of the Roman Empire were clearly visible, not only in Italy, but also in some overseas dominion. They were considered as a tangible evidence of the magnificent destiny that belonged to the Italian nation and of, of its new prime role in the, in the Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean Sea. And all this element conflated in the fascist imperial relation of the 30s. It's not by chance that Mussolini, as soon as he invaded and declared the end of the Ethiopian war, to celebrate that, uh, that moment, says the reappearance of the empire upon the fatal hills of Rome on May 1936. However, far from being relegated to the fascist imperial era, and uh, we are going to see today, uh, this discourse continued even in the aftermath of fascism. The reference to the long-term and as allegedly civilizing presence of Italy in Africa since the Roman Empire, materialized also in that ruins, often obscured in post-war Italy any critical discourse about the crimes and violence, and violence characterizing the Italian colonial endeavors. But getting back to, to, to my picture, I would like to invite you to pay a closer attention to the fact that it is slightly distorted. Um, the black and white texture veers towards noisy, unsettling colors, and also the lines and shapes are blurred, almost disturbing our view of the ruins and of, like, for instance, Mussolini. This editing aims to question the status of archaeological remains and of their representation as neutral and objective sites where to recollect the past, helping us in pointing out the active strategies to critically tackle the ongoing significance of imperial debris in our time. And in this regard, the, the use of the word debris intends to point out not simply the static nature of the ruins of imperial experiences, but also their haunting presence, still affecting political discourses, urban spaces, social, legal, cultural practices. According to the Cambridge Dictionary of English, the term debris indicates fragments, wreckages, ruins, fragmentary material randomly accumulated from the breakdown of a solid structure. So that's the perfect metaphor of the scattered legacies of the collapsing of the empire and the imperial structures whose wreckages are not simply present or absent, but still surreptitiously operative. And the hem my emphasis here shifts from, uh, from the stillness of the ruin to the process of ruination, which is the active process through which the material ruins of empire fashion our present. I am, of course, referring to the fundamental work by anthropologist and historian Anne Laura Stoller, who invites us to consider the entanglement between material and immaterial legacies of empires that still permeate post-colonial societies. The ongoing nature of the imperial processes, using her word, can be contrasted through the effort to make visible how colonialism affected our personal and collective histories, yet also how it haunts the physical and cultural landscapes in which we live. Only this way we can critically tackle the opacity in which this history resides and persists. So we are therefore going to shed a light on how archaeological remains have contributed to fashion, colonial and racial discourses in modern and contemporary Italy. 
and specific attention will be paid to the projection on, of imperial fantasies as they materialize in public spaces and buildings, in archaeological objects and sites, in colonial collections, yet also in different literary and visual representations. These themes elicit reflection upon the status of material memories of the colonial past, as well as on the contrasting series of emotions that they provoke today, especially in light of the protests against the racial and violent legacies of empires. So, today we are going to hear dialogues and talks coming from very different disciplinary fields. I'm very happy about these very wide open uh, backgrounds. Modern art and modern history, archaeology and classics, film studies, literature, cult critical studies. And such a variety of perspectives um, is essential, in my opinion, to unpack the entangled dynamics related to the significance of imperial remains and memories in modern and contemporary societies. So, the day will be structured around three main sessions. The first one, entitled Imperial Materiality at the Past in the Present, will dissect the persistent use of colonial, archaeological, architectural and exhibiting practices in Italy and beyond by pointing out the historical and discursive setting that allowed the resignification of those objects and remains. The talk featuring in the session vision, fantasies and literary remediations will shed light on literary and linguistic representation of imperial debris in modern Italian cultures by revealing to what extent fantasies and discourses about those remains helped in defining the national and fascist, especially, character of interwar expansionism. The last session is Contemporary Landscapes of Postcolonial Memory, focuses on the spatial dimension of colonial memories and on the modalities through which it's either nostalgically revealed or critically contested in some specific sites and places. So, uh, on a more, let's say, personal note, just let me conclude by expressing my heartfelt gratitude to the institution and people who welcomed me here in Cambridge. I'm super happy with this experience. Um, I would like to thank Robert, Melissa and uh, Mari for a very warm welcome and all the colleagues and friends uh, of the Italian section of the Faculty of Modern Languages, uh, of people of the crash in which I spent like fantastic time. Um, uh, I had a very enriching and stimulating time here in Cambridge but last but not least thanks to Zeyna for this fantastic organizational uh, work and just some practical info you can find all the information about papers by so on and so forth in the QR code, the big QR code in the, in, in the paper you can find outside um, just to remember to sign up the, sign up the form for the, for, for the registration and it's, it's okay, so it's fine. With no further ado, I'm happy to invite Melissa uh, Calaresu and the first speakers for our session. Um, well, thank you, Jim Marco. <laughs> I have to say that um, the feelings are mutual. <laughs> um, I think that Mary and Robert and I have really enjoyed um, your kind of energy and your engagement. Um, your friendliness, I think, has been um, wonderful. And I'm, I'm sorry that we haven't had that much time to talk this term, but I understand you might be around for a little bit longer. Um, but I understand also in the Italian department, you've been quite a kind of active so thank you very much, and thank you for being so well organized <laughs> um, and putting together such an interesting program. Thank you. Okay, so the first section, or the first um, a session is Imperial Materiality, the Past and the Present, and I should say before I start that I'm neither a classicist or a modernist. I'm an early modernist. I work on early modern Italy, um, and I've been asked to introduce the first three speakers. My understanding is speakers will speak for 20 to 22 minutes, yep. and then there's plenty of time for discussion, so please um, keep some, get, get some questions um, on paper in your head um, so that we can ask the speakers at the end and start the, sort of the beginning of a dialogue. 
So our first speaker is Jan uh, Nellis, who's from the University Free University of Brussels, and um, he is a he's, he's a historian. Is that fair? Classicist. Yes. Classicist. Classicist by 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 training um, and uh, is interested in the idea of Romanità and the classical tradition in fascism and. Um, started off working on Nazism and now is working on Italian fascism. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Free University, the Free University in uh, in Brussels. So I'll pass you on to Jan. Jan wanted me to distribute this. Should I do it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. If I can give you that. Ah. Eh, sì, però no, non parte. Let's send away. I don't know why. Hmm? Ah, well, let's try it. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Did you guys find Jaya? I don't know why. I'll look at the photos. Shall I look at the photos? Fantastic. Okay, so I have to improvise. Uh, okay. yeah, also, we have to share the screen. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I presented, I prepared a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation which worked on my computer, but visibly doesn't work here. So it's going to be a bit different, a bit uh, adapted. Uh, that's, that's not a real problem. I have, uh, have my, uh, my paper here. So. Voilà. Thank you, uh, Gianmarco, for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Teresa San Paolo, as well. Um, I, um, I saw the title of, the, of this conference, and it was really, really attractive for me, because, I, as, as, as uh, our colleague said, uh, um, I work on Romanità, which is the reception of antiquity on Italian, Italian fascism, which uh, I see as a myth. And I, I mean, everybody sees that as a myth, the myth of the founding of Italy. Um, in antiquity, which was uh, an inheritance to, to contemporary to and fascists didn't use that. And I saw here the word uh, fantasies, which is uh, which was, has been quite never been used in, in stuff I read in, in any case uh, for this Romanità. So thank you for this uh, suggestion as well, which comes from the very studies as, as you told me yesterday. So that's uh, so a nice concept, I think, to, uh, um, to work on and, and to use in, in this context. Uh, so um, when I uh, presented my, the subject of my, of my paper to, to Gianmarco, he told me to speak a bit about uh, Part archaeology, speak a bit um, about uh, architecture as well. So I call mm -hmm. it neo neologism, I think. Uh, I didn't know it in any case. Architect theology. So uh, my speech today will be about um, the way in which Italian fascism recep receptionized antiquity and the way in which this uh, imperialist drive, which is linked to colonialism, I'll speak less of colonialism than specialists uh, here present, uh, the way in which this uh, was integrated in, in, into fascist. Uh, fascist ideology uh, into fascism seen as a political religion, uh, as a way in which uh, you have a, have a mythic side, political side, and a religious cultic side. So uh, there are some, uh, some of those pictures I'd, um, I'm going to show now, so photos came here. I'm sorry about the, the somewhat uh, different, uh, difficult way in which I'm going to show uh, stuff because I don't really have my, my PowerPoint. Told you so. Uh, uh, large icon, so you yeah. can see the pictures. Yeah. Um, so a mythical side. You had the founding of Rome. You had the march on Rome, for example, in 1922. Uh, you had fascists marching onto Rome. So that was already an action uh, in, in the context of this cult of, of ancient Rome, uh, which you see, for example, here on Piazza Venezia as well, with big uh, raduni, big meetings of people uh, in ancient, uh, in, in contemporary Rome enacting the fact that they are in a new imperial uh, Italy in this uh, case, in any case. I have to close this. So, political religion with a, a mythical side and a, a, a cultic side to it. A uh, cultic side, which you have, for example, as well in uh, Nazi Germany, which is here, for example, the case. Uh, this is Nuremberg, where you have this cathedral of light, Albert Speer, the architect, which was an architect, of course, uh, uh, who was an architect, uh, called this his uh, cathedral of of light that was, of course, under uh, under Nazism, under Italian fascism. We had, for example, in this uh, neoclassical uh, style of buildings. This is the. Uh, it's not the Casa dei Caduti. Sorry, I'm looking for the other uh, another picture which I wanted uh, to show. Uh, the Casa dei. Um, yeah, you have all kinds of pictures, of course, because I. Um, 
Ah, voilà. La Casa dei Mutilati, which is, of course, the, 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 the home of the, the war veterans. The First World War was always already, uh, also a, a, an important myth, a founding myth of Italian fascism. So the, the, the war veterans were uh, part of this myth. And, of course, in this neoclassical uh, architecture, not archaeological style, of course, uh, you had this, uh, this myth of, uh, not of Rome, but of the uh, First World War, which, is, uh, which was uh, given shape in this uh, political uh, religion. So I'll uh, go to the next point uh, at the level of uh, the adaptation of fascism as a political religion uh, is one point. And then there's always uh, there's also the point which I wanted to 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 to, to, uh, to illustrate the fact that it's uh, can be inter interpreted as a modern modernist uh, movement drive. You see here the the, the book by um, Roger Griffin, who uh, shows here uh, uh, the arch, the modern uh, the quite interesting uh, gateway arch in. Uh, the, um, Arch in uh, the EU uh, quarter in Italy, but which was um, copied in the United States in St. Louis, the uh, Gateway Arch. So you see that this uh, this architecture developed by uh, Italian fascism, uh, which had a, quite a, a modern uh, side to it, as you will see in uh, some other pictures, uh, such as this one, for, for example, the Colosseo Quadrato, the Palazzo della Città del Lavoro, which was created for the, the big. Uh, big exposition in 42. Well, this is uh, quite an, 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 uh, an architectural style which takes elements from the past, of course, from the, uh, from the Colosseum, for example, which was at the height of the Rome's imperial uh, period and uh, was created uh, during fascism. And it still exists today. That, that, that's a link as well uh, and is used today uh, for many uh, various scopes. So that's a link as well to the, the, the reception today of all this uh, the debate that's on today in Italy and abroad about uh, what to do with uh, buildings that date from this uh, spirit and uh, can incarnate many, uh, many, uh, uh, many contents. Um, so a modern modernist drive, you can see that as well in, for example, uh, Augusteo. So that's a tomb of um, uh, Emperor Aug Augustus in uh, ancient. Uh, ancient Rome, of course, which under fascism was liberated from uh, structures that were uh, surrounding it. This is a, a present day, for this, like uh, 15 years ago I took this picture of the Augustus, that's a tomb of uh, Augustus. And the interesting thing here is with this architectology, as I said, is that there were buildings surrounding this, uh, this tomb, uh, which were, of course, in, in new buildings. So uh, excavations in Rome and abroad, abroad you, you maybe speak of that, were often accompanied by uh, architecture. So in order to, to, to really create a symbol of this, uh, this new Rome, which inspired itself uh, from antiquity, which we'll see as well in the Via dell'Impero, uh, which you can see as well in the Eur, where there's no archaeology. Yes, of course, the Eur, the uh, 42, was a new city quarter created in the, in the 40s, continued after the war, uh, which was intended to link Italy, uh, link Rome to the sea, such as in ancient times, of course, when you had Ostia and Roman imperial port, uh, well, part of it, um, which was a gateway to the to, to the sea and to, of course, the, the development of, of an empire. Now, um, some examples of uh, the way in which uh, this fascist imperialism uh, and, uh, in many cases as well, architecture, less in the first case but uh, more in, in the other ones, uh, went together is, for example, the Via dell'Impero, which is, of course, the, the today the Via del Furi Imperiali. Uh, which is this uh, street, which I'll, uh, I'll have to look for the, for the picture. Um, you'll see it. Sorry, I really have to, because I don't have the PowerPoint. Um, If anyone sees it, <laughs> on here, uh, right. I can't seem to, f to find the picture. Uh, but the Via Fur Imperiali is in uh, ancient, in contemporary Rome. So you have the Palazzo Venezia uh, at the end of Via del Corso, which goes to the Colosseum, uh, where you have now a straight road going uh, from one point to the other. When under before fascism in the beginning, there were all these imperial fora, which were uh, and and ancient and contemporary buildings covering this street. So this street was really an, an, an iconic street which was liberated, created under fascism. So they did some excavations, destroyed everything contemporary that was on top of it and just made a big street. 
in order to show uh, this uh, iconically, to show this, uh, this way in which uh, ancient uh, Rome and contemporary Rome and future Rome went together. So you could, you could go from, uh, from the Colosseum, from ancient Rome to Palazzo Venezia, where you also had the, the, the symbol of the Vittoriano, the uh, Roman, uh, the Italian uh, monarchy. I see the picture here. Voila, that's a good one. So uh, you have here the Colosseum. That's Via dei Fori Imperiali, so Via dell'Impero at, at the time, of course, the, 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 the imperial street. Here you had uh, Palazzo Venezia, which, is, which was a Renaissance building, but used by uh, Mussolini as his headquarters, where he uh, spent uh, some time, <coughs> of course, in his, uh, in his office, which had a view on this, uh, on this piazza, which I showed in, in, another, uh, in another slide just, uh, just before. So Via dell'Impero. Less new architecture, which was not the case in the uh, Augusteo, so the, the, the tomb of, uh, of Augustus, which I already showed you, uh, and which was surrounded, this tomb, by uh, buildings in this uh, architectural, uh, neoclassical, in a certain sense, style, which you can, for example, see here. Um, this one is, uh, this is a building which is next to, more or less, the, the Augusteo, the tomb of Augustus, so that's, uh, that's uh, definitely a neoclassical architectural style which is uh, intended to incarnate using as well bas-reliefs and, and uh, inscriptions for example il popolo italiano or il popolo immortale so again these, uh, these slogans <coughs> which was also which were also put on these uh, facades uh, one which you can all still see today is, is this one for example uh, just next to the, the restaurant uh, Gusto it still exists uh, you can have pizza there often uh, you still have even the word uh, Mussolini on, on on the facade, so I'm not, uh, not sure I'd see Mussolini Dux. Mussolini Dux. Um, so the EU, uh, EU uh, city quarter, I told, spoke about that already, so that's the new, the new quarter which was intended to link Rome uh, to the sea, is of course a very important uh, traduction, translation of this, uh, of, of, of this, uh, this drive towards uh, the recuperation of antiquity and the projection of antiquity onto the, onto the, the future. You could see, uh, for example, this is uh, so the uh, Colosseo Quadrato, so the Palazzo della Civita del Lavoro. There's also a church there, so that's another point which I wanted to, to underscore, which uh, is the fact that you're talking about a political religion. Of course, in Italy, you also have the Catholicism, the traditional religion. Both went more or less hand in hand, except when uh, interests were shared, for example, in youth movements. There was no really opposition against uh, the church and Italian fascism, only when uh, the societal branch of both uh, parties' interests uh, collided, which was the case in, uh, I think it was in 32, and in 38, when, um, not because of the racial laws, but because of uh, the fact that converted Jews were also um, concerned by racial laws. It was not Jews as such who were uh, in the interests of the, the Italian Catholic uh, Church, which, in, in other cases, such as in, in 29, uh, had, had agreements, made agreements with fascism and, and, and vice versa. So, uh, the EU quarter, I showed some, some, some slides of it. Uh, for example, this is another one, uh, very interesting uh, city quarter as well, because you have the, the, the National Archives there, the, the Archivio Centrale dello Stato, which is, uh, which is this one, uh, where you can find uh, very interesting material, of course, uh, on, on fascism, uh, correspondence between Mussolini and various uh, other people's other people uh, this is taken from you you see one of the central axis of this uh, EO quarter, quarter this is the picture of today of course the, 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 the church of course is still there uh, and this is the hallway of the what today is the, the, the central archive so you see really this uh, this actual uh, ground plan which is uh, which has been implemented uh, since uh, since fascism as I told Romantica uh, Roma sul mare, so the link you linked Rome to the sea. Well, this is uh, another picture which uh, which is interesting in this context. It's the Teatro di Marcello, which is from uh, the, the, the Capitol Hill goes towards more or less is the beginning of the, the way uh, towards the sea. So the the, the Theatre of Marcellus, the Teatro di Marcello, is uh, was also liberated from uh, surrounding uh, structures and uh, put back to light. Uh, this is, of course, a <laughs> picture of today, um, which I took uh, some years ago. Uh, so this is like the beginning of the way towards, uh, towards the sea. You have ancient uh, Rome, antiquity, Marcellus, of course, is uh, theatre, and uh, the way in which uh, this was used uh, by contemporary fascists to, uh, to, to 
stage itself, in a certain sense. Um, the Stadio dei Marmi, that's uh, the last uh, real example. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you so the, the, the four Italico, sorry, uh, more than the Stadio uh, dei Marmi. So, in the north of it of uh, Rome, you had the you had a new Forum Mussolini, so the Forum of Mussolini, like an ancient emperor, he had his own forum, he created his own forum, which uh, which was a whole complex of buildings and also a, a, an ancient, uh, ancient a new stadium, which uh, athletic stadium, which tried to emulate ancient uh, stadiums, which is uh, the one I'm showing uh, here with a, quite an impressionist picture, with all these marble statues, and behind it you see a modern uh, football stadium which was used for, I think, Olympics and World Cup of Soccer in 1990, I think. So these uh, these uh, statues, uh, as you can see, incarnate uh, this uh, this recept this heritage of antiquity projected onto the past and onto uh, the future. At least that's the way in which it can be seen. So we're not talking about architecture here. We're um, about archaeology. We're talking about architecture. The way in which architecture and the arts, of course, these are statues, are uh, used uh, by uh, developed by uh, fascist uh, state and are still uh, in, in, in use today as you can see here. Uh, in any case that's like 10 years ago so I'm not sure <coughs> but I suppose that today it's, uh, it's still being used, still going on. Um, as well I had a Facebook post which I saw some days ago but I'm not sure I'll, I'll find it. Ah, the picture. Okay. Um, I'll just show you the, the, the buildings one of the buildings is this one, that's the center today of the Italian Olympic uh, Com Committee uh, mm -hmm. Society, in which you can find, for example, uh, still today, uh, this picture. Uh, somebody uh, shared it on, 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 uh, on Facebook some, some, some time ago, so we have all these uh, contemporary people. That's the day, of course, that's not uh, talking about fascism, but you see the way in which uh, still these, uh, these fresks, for example, where you have uh, our friend Mussolini here, uh, he's still looking upon the Italian uh, Olympic Committee. I'm not sure they, they're really aware of that, but I think they should be because he's quite quite visible. So if there's really an importance of all these uh, these uh, these issues still today in, in, in contemporary Italy and, and like in, in the streets, in the buildings. They're still present. There. There's not much uh, destruction that, that went on at the level of, of all these uh, things. So that's a very interesting, I think, uh, point of debate as well. The way in which uh, today, okay, yeah, perfect. Uh, today one handles uh, these uh, these uh, relics. Uh, these uh, relics they're, they're not debris, of course, um, as well. The term debris found very interesting as well to, to project onto the, the reception of antiquity by fascism, which today has become, in a sense, uh, scattered around Italy. Uh, has been interpreted, has been used, digested and has been tra translated into uh, various, uh, various discourses as well. Uh, so um, the last uh, point is something which uh, is linked really to colonialism now. So that's, uh, as I told you, it's not really my specialty, but I'd, I had distributed a, a letter written by uh, a fascist politician, uh, Giuseppe Bottai, who was really involved in culture, uh, among other things, was a, uh, one of the foremost uh, fascist gerarchi, so the, fascist hierarchs, uh, politician, and this uh, Bottai wrote in uh, 1936, he was in Africa uh, during the imperial campaign, uh, beginning of 1936, so the, the six, January 6th of the 14th uh, year of the, the fascist era, so it's 1936 in this case, so Bottai is a politician who was a big friend of uh, Galcano Galassi Paluzzi, who in this case, Galassi Paluzzi was the founder and the, the, the president of the Istituto di Studi Romani. So that's an institution which uh, studied Rome in all of its, uh, its uh, all of its faces, its permutations, etc. So not only uh, ancient uh, Rome but also Catholic Rome, which especially for Galassi Paluzzi was uh, an important uh, issue because he was uh, converted Catholic. So as a con as, you, as you might know, converted uh, Catholics or other religions are often more uh, more, more strong believers than, than, than um, traditional uh, believers. So this Carlo uh, Galassi Paluzzi really wanted to make, wanted to, to, to underline the synthesis between um, between fascism in the case of this uh, Istituto di Studi Romani and uh, and Catholicism. I have the, the letter here which I found in um, in the archives of uh, I think it was in the 
Archives in the Instituto, which is a TypeScript, a copy of a TypeScript. So uh, Botai was in Africa. Uh, both um, were very uh, big friends. Botai was always also very interested in everything that concerned culture, uh, academia, and um, scientific uh, publications on antiquity and on Catholic Rome. So uh, the, in the, in the interesting thing here is that uh, Botai, being in Africa, write, wrote this, uh, this, this letter to Dalassi Paluzzi, which was uh, unedited until I found it, which was really, for those with an interest in antiquity and, and in Romanita, really a nice, uh, beautiful uh, letter. Uh, so he writes, uh, Caro amico, so the dear friend, uh, only today have I received your letter from uh, December 13. The um, ritardo, so the, the, the delay, um, has uh, given me uh, una buona befana, so it's... Uh, <laughs> Facendomi, uh, so uh, he's speaking here of a programma così denso, so it's, uh, I might be reading in Italian, it might be because I'm translating like this. Facendomi sulla scorta di un programma così denso, qual è quello del ventesimo anno, del tuo, del nostro istituto, so he's speaking about the Istituto di Studi Romani, pensare ancora più intensamente a Roma. So he's in, in Africa and uh, looking into the stuff that Galassi Paluzzi uh, has given him and is organizing. He, he, really thinking of Rome. So that's a private measure. That's not somebody who's just writing this to be published in, in propaganda or anything. That's really an internal feeling. And it's been confirmed by the fact that both, both guys were uh, state friends until uh, in the 50s. Um, tu sai perché l'ho scritto e tu hai la bontà di leggere qualche volta le mie cose che il mio amore per Roma è stato tardivo. So uh, Bottai says his, his love for Rome is a bit, uh, is, 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 it's quite a late, uh, Late Bloom, uh, me lo sono sentito fluire nel mio sangue non romano di nato a Roma in questi ultimi anni a cominciare da quella marcia che per me fu, un, uh, che fu per me una marcia ideale verso, verso una città dello spirito. So an ideal march, speaking of the march on Rome, an ideal march, in the context of myth, of ideas, of fantasy as well, uh, if you wish, uh, in, towards a, a city of spirit. That's, uh, I thought it was uh, interesting to, to, to show this. As well, uh, linked to imperialism, because you have physical imperialism, colonialism, imperialism also is a spiritual kind of way of thinking, and that's where, of course, we're in the context of this uh, reception of uh, ancient imperial antiquity. So there he says, Ora in questa terra sconfinata, so he's in Africa, senza città, e cioè bada, non rurale che il lavoro dell'uomo non scalfisce neppur la crossa dei campi, ma priva di quel principio di ordine e di disciplina politica, che per noi romani rappresenta la città o l'urbe, se credi meglio, in questa terra dico il pensiero è talvolta addirittura il fantasma di Roma. So, voilà, that's, uh, that's one, one thing I wanted to underscore, the fantasma, the, the fantasma, fantasy in some way, of Rome. Um, mi seguono in ogni momento della mia vita di soldato. So it's, uh, he's there in, in, in the context of course, of course of a military uh, campaign. And... Um, you can you can uh, you can read along because uh, afterwards he's speaking really about the fact that he's uh, he's, uh, he's a soldier and he's really uh, doing that for Rome in the sign of Rome. So as I said, it's really uh, a personal, uh, really heartfelt heartfelt letter by a fascist to another fascist uh, Catholic fascist uh, uh, representative of the cultural world in any case. But really interesting to see how uh, these people uh, interacted uh, in this context. And I think that's, uh, that's good. And sorry again, because it's really, I, without my PowerPoint, I was a bit, uh, wow. a bit lost, but I just looked for the pictures. And we'll, let's finish with this one. Really. Thank you and sorry again. <laughs> Afternoon. The, the questions after. Yeah. Yeah, and that was very impressive. <laughs> Just like, also, you didn't have any um, kind of unusual in pictures in your. <laughs> in there, so I thought it was very impressive. No pictures of dogs or. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> but thank you. Um, okay. Um, I think what I'll do while Beatrice is getting ready. Um, introduce Beatrice Falcucci, who's an Aquila, and no, it's fine, it's fine. she is, I don't dare say, she's a historian? Yeah. Yes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's a historian uh, who did her PhD at the University of Florence, and she's been in the, now 
Peabody Institute in Turin and also the American Academy in Rome. And she's currently in Aquila. And she's going to talk about Between Empires, Exhibiting Archaeology and Displaying Power in Fascist Italy. So I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you and thank you, Gianmarco, for your invitation. And it's a pleasure being here uh, with you all. So uh, today I'll try to make a reflection on the exploitative relation um, with women wounds and antiquities in Italian and Libyan uh, museum doing fascism and also today. Uh, also in association with Russia discourses about the North African peoples. So restoring these archaeological finds and artifacts, this plunder, is a question which confronts many institutions and countries urgently across the globe. Unfortunately, Italy's government and Italian museum continue to characterize themselves, let's say, mainly as victims of spoliation. Let's think about World War II and the Napoleon times. Rather than as agents of imperialism, racism, and extraction, who acquired many of their objects and artifacts at the expense of, we will see, Libya and others, of course. So, here is a, a very simple chronology to highlight the importance of archaeology in the process of the colonization of Libya. You can see a mission led by archaeologist Salvatore Aurigemma pointing out the presence of the Christian burial ground of Ain Zara shortly before the invasion of Libya. As a consequence of the invasion of Libya, we also have the setup of the Ministry of Colonies on the 20th of November 1912. So turning the central direction of colonial affairs within the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs into a separate ministry. And we also have the invasion of Rhodes, May 1912, as part of the Italo-Turkish War, ending nearly 400 years of Ottoman rule. And we will circle back to Rhodes at the end of my uh, paper. The spoils of the war in Libya, which has just ended, at least formally, were put on display almost immediately at the 1914 Esposizione Internazionale di Marina di Gene Marinara e Mostra Coloniale Italiana, which inaugurated in Genoa uh, in May at the presence of the Italian royal family. So in the Genoese exhibition, the space reserved for the colonies was unprecedented. Even if colonial sections and pavilions had already appeared in exhibition in Turin in 1884, Palermo in 1892, Florence 1903, Milan 1906, again in Turin in 1911. So in general, reconstruction of fortresses and mosques in their actual dimension were erected, and in a space in front of the pavilion, Turkish cannon and a campsite with so-called Bedouin tents were placed on display. The Libyan colonies of Tripolitania and Cirenaica were presented from that very first occasion as the flagship of the Italian colonies overseas. So the Genoese exhibition, which proved to be a great popular success, coincided with the outbreak of the First World War. Despite the intention to proceed immediately after the, conclu the conclusion of the exhibition with the creation of a colonial museum, the war, of course, froze all the ongoing programs. Um, the situation changed with Benito Mussolini's seizure of power in 1922. The fascist party that had just risen to power won in a museum that would serve uh, to convey its policy of prestige and power, since, especially in the aftermath of the war and the peace agreement that were signed, Italy's reputation abroad did not correspond to the image that the regime wished to give of itself. But for the moment, let's stay in Libya. So it was only in 1919 that Libya's first real archaeological museum was set up inside the Red Castle in Tripoli. And in 1923, archaeologist Renato Bartoccini was appointed director, and under his aegis, the museum expanded in size and adopted an ideological organization in an attempt to uh, offer the public a nationalistic celebration of the ancient world based on the idea of Romanità and Italianità. His arrival both uh, marked a surge in acquisition by the museum, including new collection from Sabrata and Pisida, as he was not in favor of local museum, believing it was important to have a single and central institution in Tripoli, and new investments in archaeology. His approach can be detected in a museum guide that Bartoccini produced, which dwelt on the discovery of a remarkable numbers of Roman villas all along the, Roman, uh, the Tripolitanian coast, and on the trace of Christian life. In contrast, he emphasized the lack of evidence of Muslim domination, which in his view must have resulted from, uh, I quote, the intellectual and cultural poverty of the invaders compared to the Roman predecessor. So Bartuccini stated that the Muslim, I quote again, uh, while bitterly opposed to all memories of the idolaters, both pagan and Christian, 
were unable, however, to have this obliterated by other works that they themselves created. Also evident, according to Bartocini, was the inability of contemporary Libyans to adequately per preserve the vestige of the Roman past and enter into a dialogue with them. In order to give publicity and ad academic prestige to the excavation and restoration work, in 1925, an international congress of classical archaeology was organized in Tripoli, uh, with the most renowned European scholars invited. Under Bart Bartocini's successor, archaeologist Giacomo Guidi, the museum expanded again. In Guidi's museum, the return of Christian civilization was represented by a small fountain believed to have, uh, to have been brought to Tripoli by the Knights of Malta. Another interpretative key for navigating the museum was the harmony between colonized and colonizers. So the idea was to illustrate the good relationship between Roman provinces and Rome, the, the empire provinces and Rome, presenting the colonizers of the Roman era as submissive and loyal, implied that modern Libyans should behave in the same way. For example, there was the display of this cast of new uh, Punic inscription from Leptis Magna that translated the uh, titles of Augustus, basically. So recognizing him as emperor and therefore indicating the submission of the indigenous population to Rome and giving the four the chance to identify Augustus with Mussolini. So in my opinion, this can spark a reflection on the idea of race and the double balance of Libyan belonging, let's say, in the 1920s and 1930s, and the development of an idea of an Italian race set against the colonized North Africans. So between 1928 and 1932 in Cirenaica, tens of thousands of Libya were relocated and their lands was given to the Italian settlers. They were also forced to, more, to march across the desert into con concentration camp, which by the way, unofficially of the Ministry of the Colonies, um, Angelo Piccioli in an article on Africa Italiana, claimed to be inspired by the Roman tent camps in their structure. And uh, thousands, of course, of Libyans died in squalid conditions in those uh, camps. Superintendent of Antiquities, Gaspar Oliviero, in an article published in the magazine Cirenaica Illustrata in 1933, thanked Marshal Graziani for having, I quote, eradicated Bedouin arrogance. Simultaneously, studies on the Libyan population were carried out. Such studies, like the anthropometric mission carried out by anthropologist Nello Puccioni, you can see here some of the results, in Cirenaica in 1928-1929, uh, referred to physical features and drew upon racial categories for the identification and classification of the people living in Libya. So at the time, uh, anthropometry was used extensively by anthropologists studying human and racial origins. The goal was to discern racial differentiation and classification, seeking ways to determine if certain races were inferior to others. The elaboration of a coherent racist discourse required the, produ the production of research that looks scientific and in that archaeology and the study of classic and anthropology converged. So about beauty, um, that was in Mussolini mind in, in inextricably linked to all things ancient Roman, uh, he stated, in Rome and wherever Rome arrives in the world with its legions and its powerful spirit, we feel we are in front of a force of beauty that it's not only a manifestation of a higher state of the spirit and civilization, but has in itself the brilliant germ of Italian art. So taking Mussolini's word into account, which difference were there between the ancient inhabitants of the Roman province of Libya which had given birth to such celebrated emperors such as Septimius Severus, and the inhabitants of the colonies, uh, fascist colony Libya, subjected to deportations. If the inhabitants of ancient Libya, such as Severan emperors, who deemed fully Roman, um, at least until 1938, and maybe we can talk about this later uh, in the discussion, uh, were celebrated in the newly established archaeological museum, the current inhabitants of the country were considered to be clearly inferior. In 1929, Puccioni wrote in his diary, I believe that few peoples are as ethnographically poor as the nomads of Cirenaica. As the Libyan population were photographed and measured, the Libyan Museum of Natural History in Tripoli was established. It's the only non-archaeological museum established in Libya during the period of Italian occupation. 
and its emergence followed a series of uh, expeditions mounted by the Italian Geographical Society between 1932 and 1935, led by scientists prominent in their field, such as anthropologist Lidio Cipriani, later one of the ideators of the Manifesto della Razza. So Governor Italo Balbo himself suggested that the collection could be permanently housed in Libya and that an appropriate venue should be established for the, for the uh, exhibition. The museum uh, had rooms dedicated to mineralogy and at the time we know the oil exploration was underway, Libyan fauna, paleontology and so on, and finally humans. But this diminished as a picturesque element, let's say. No agency on the part of the people measured is communicated by the anthropological materials they claim to know them thoroughly. All we know, for example, about Atiga, one of the women in Cirenaica measured and photographed by Piccioni, is that she was a prostitute, although that itself is questionable, and her name probably misspelled, who knows. So this facial cast and picture were on display not only in museums, such as the Florentine Museum of Anthropology that some of you may know, but copies of the casts were made, and we will back to the importance of copies, and displayed also in exhibition abroad and in Italy, as well as in the Colonial Museum in Rome and in various exhibitions in Italy and abroad, side by side with ancient uh, uh, Roman archaeological finds, and we will see this uh, shortly. So in contrast to North African humans, archaeological finds seem to have a well-defined agency. Their discovery was defined as a resurrection, their very essence was considered to be the soul of the fathers, and one very famous example is that of the statue of the Venice of uh, Cirene, in particular, that was described um, as re-emerging from the sand, as Simona Troilo pointed out. So I will skip this. Um, and as anticipated, I will now discuss the presence of archaeological artifacts in fascist colonial exhibition. The exhibition abroad and in Italy uh, were usually organized by the Ministry of the Colonies and the Colonial Museum in Rome, which was part of its official studio. In this respect, an interesting example is the 1931 uh, Expo in Paris, which has been studied in detail by Maddalena Carli. Uh, but as, as can be seen in this postcard, the Italian pavilion focused firmly on a, a classical aesthetic. Uh, while the one dedicated to Rhodes uh, played on the presumed Italianness of the um, island and its nights. So the aspect that I would like to draw your attention to, however, uh, concern an, uh, an aspect of the exhibition related to the fruition of Roman archaeology. Uh, this picture that I found during a collaborative project between the Università dell'Aquila and the Isiao Library in Rome are part of the collection of the official studio of the former Ministry of the Colonies and show the backstage, let's say, of the construction of the Paris Pavilion in 1931. Mm -hmm. This image represents the assemblages of copies of statues found in Libya by the Italians, and which were traveled for the exhibitions and displayed abroad. So these are the statues of Mart, Mercury, there's a copy of the uh, famous banner of Cirene as well. So according to Timothy Mitchell in his book, Colonizing Egypt, Everything both imitates and it's imitated. There is no simple division into an order of copies and an order of originals, of picture and what they represent, of exhibits and reality, of the text and the real world, of signifiers and signified. So in essence, in essence, we have a complete blurring of the lines between real and fake, copy and original. And in fact, copies were displayed in scenic and pyrotechnic settings visited by hundreds of thousands of people and the original kept in storage, available to scholars. Also, the um, materials that were not specifically archaeological and not just copies and reproduction, but also models of archaeological sites, we will see them, photographs and maps were used in expositions and in the Colonial Museum of Rome uh, itself from the 1930s onwards, in this new layout in the Aldrovan del Giardino Zoologico mixed with other kinds of objects and image, and that's just an example. So let's jump to the end of the Italian colonial rule. In September 1948, under Secretary Giuseppe Brusasca, director of the, um, with the director of the museum Massimo Adolfo Vitale, organized a visit to the Museo dell'Africa Italiana, while at the, UN, at the UN, the Memorandum on the Italian colonies was under discussion, as Italy wanted to keep the pre-fascist colonies, including Libya, of course, despite losing the war. 
Um, in this film by Industria Cortometraggi Milano, Incom, uh, titled Testimonianze della nostra civiltà in Africa, after some passages about the Paris conference, we, um, it, it, the, the, the film was staged at the museum, and we see Brusasca, accompanied by Leopoldo Traversi, uh, a famous explorer, uh, that was filmed visiting uh, the, the museum. So the objects on display in the museum were shown to corroborate this narrative, this narrative of the benefit that Italy brought to Africa. So starting from uh, documents of the region, the regional documents of the acquisition of the Baia Sab by Giuseppe Sapeto, we see some arms by Vittorio Bottego, logs of former slaves freed by Vincenzo Filonardi, the first governor of Italian Somalia, and also some scale models against not proper artifacts, such as uh, the Arch of Marco Aurelius in Tripoli and the Roman Theatre of Sabrato. So this apologetic news reel was uploaded by the Cabinet of Ministers of Italian Africa, that was a post held at the time uh, at interim by uh, De Gasperi. And once again, ancient ruins were used to justify the idea of the return, one more time, of the Italians to North Africa. Let's jump again to this date. On the 25th of May 2020, a press conference dedicated to the rearrangement of the museum, uh, the Museo Coloniale, took place virtually uh, at the Museo della Civiltà. And the reopening of the former colonial museum was planned to happen in uh, 2021. So during the press conference, the new name of the museum, Museo Italo Africano Ilari Alpi, was presented with an explanation of the dedication to the Italian reporter Ilari Alpi, killed in Somalia in 1994. It is interesting to note that the name Italo Africano reminds a rather generic historical connection, not explicitly mentioning the, the colonial face and the distinctive Eurocentric posture, at least, which informed the colonial museology. So in this context, and in light of the problematic and partially unacknowledged results of colonial legacy in Italy, the, the na problematic nature of such um, heritage seemed to remain hidden. And also confusing seemed the idea of starting the museum route with the supposedly ancient relationship dating back to ancient Roman times between the peninsula and Africa manifesting the desire, once again, to see in the United Italy the heir of ancient Rome. The former director, trained as an archaeologist, justifies this idea of a new display, namely, uh, if I may, quoting Cato. So, in 2021, the Muciv, shelving the new display of the uh, colonial collection, decided not to shelve the, the, um, uh, the entire collection, but just um, uh, presented the project of this temporary exhibition called Unveil Solge. So, in a, an installation using the regional cabinets from the 19th century, as you can see, first picture, um, you can see a selection of objects from the collections of the former colonial museum. The objects are wrapped in cellophane, seen through the transparency of some text banner asking questions like how to present the colonial discourse, how to avoid the celebration, how to deconstruct the myths of Roman Empire. And you can see also, again, some of the famous copies. And here you can see a copy of the Venus. Um, concerning the museum, the most recent change in the museum management led to a new press conference uh, last year, which uh, disavowed, let's say, what had been said up to the point in the previous di director plans for the museum. But maybe if you're interested in this, we can discuss it later. Here's another recent example of displaying uh, archaeological material from a colonial context. This is part of a small group of archaeological artifacts collected by Mario Atti, corporal of the 4th Bologna Red Cross Ambulance in Broad in 1912. Uh, this, is on display, this was on display for the first time uh, last year at the Museo di Risorgimento in Bologna. So no information originally accompanied the artifacts other than a tag indicating that they came from Rhodes, and that was it. So the curators contextualized it within the exhibition dedicated to Libya. Again, a larger, uh, a larger nucleus of objects collected by the Red Cross uh, in 1911-1912. So the fact that this collection was sent to the Museum of Risorgimento, although not permanently exhibited, allows us to conclude by emphasizing how much colonial expansion and the mythical past of the peninsula were believed to be related to the process of unification and coming to a nation, and how much they still are. So this is a, a printed publication, Romanamente, of the website Italia Coloniale, which is entitled 
come l'Italia fascista valorizzò l'archeologia in Africa, l'altra faccia del colonialismo italiano. So this may seem paradoxical after seeing how selective, partial and aimed the idea of a spectacle uh, rather than conservation was the musealization of Italian colonial archaeology, especially in the 30s. But despite this, this publication does have an audience. And you can see in the Google search, Italia Coloniale appears before even the Wikipedia page dedicated to Italian colonialism. So I think much remains to be done today to counter this myth, and thank you for your attention. Okay, Simona, can you hear us? Yes, I try to share my presentation. Can you see it? Because I don't see you. So yeah. tell me if you... Okay. Okay, I'll Everything try to... Fine. Melissa okay. is going to present you. Yes, for... okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Beatrice. That's super interesting. Okay, um, so it's the third speaker, and um, I think Simona is there. Simona Troilo, um, who's an associate professor of contemporary history at the University of La Aquila. Um, her research uh, um, looks at the use of antiquities in imperialism and colonialism, so very much matches up with the two papers we've heard so far. So I will pass over to Simona, who will speak about materials and imagery of Roma, Rom, Romanita, I guess, of Libya between fascist and Republican Italy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Sorry, I'm not there with you. Anyway, uh, what I would like to do in these uh, uh, 20 minutes is to analyze some continuities between fascist and post-fascist Italy, starting from those archaeological remains that over time had taken on an important role in identifying Italianists. I will therefore talk mainly about Roman remains and the way they shaped a specific imagery. Then I'll show how many aspects of this imagery still feed the Italian colonial archive. And to do can you hear me? We should be able to see you, Simona, I think, because otherwise it's just a disembodied voice. Um, well, but I think that... I, should I, be... I, I, can, I, I cannot see you. The problem is that I cannot see you. Yes, um, yeah. that way is better. Okay, okay yeah. Simona. Yeah. yeah, just because... No, oh, is, is it okay? Yes, yeah. no, okay. Perfect. Right. Okay. Simona. okay. Um, so to do this, uh, we recall two questions. That of the decolonization of heritage and that of the restitution of objects looted from past colonies. I will therefore propose to you to follow one of these objects and read through its restitution the legacies of colonial imagery. Indeed, I believe that restitution is a particularly rich field of research, which is worth analyzing in depth in order to understand colonialism in general and colonial archive in particular. As already mentioned, the power of the Roman Empire in legitimizing fascist policy was huge, and this was the reason why Roman remains were glorified, celebrated, and safeguarded both in Italy and its Libyan colony. Here, however, the remains of Rome played a leading role even before fascism, as the war against the Ottoman Empire and the annexation of the new colony were culturally legitimized by the very meat of Rome. As the supporters of expansion into Africa claimed, Italy was not going but going back to its ancient colony to regain control over it. And the Roman remains scattered through the territory testified to the link between the two shores of the Mediterranean that were finally reunited. The Rome-based epic of the return was widely exploited by the war propaganda ruins and artifacts from the imperial age were photographed and publicized to strengthen support for the conquest, while many objects were transferred and exhibited in national museums to enhance the historical link between Italy and its port shore. The importance of these materials produced two results, the start of the patrimonialization and the beginning of their massive use in identity terms. And what does it mean? 
that as early as 1912, restoration, such as that of the Arch of Marco Aurelius, l'Arco di Marco Aurelio, were started, museum, as uh, um, um, Beatrice already said, established, and new excavation campaigns initiated. And also from 1912, Libya, through Romanes and Romanity, was incorporated into Italianness. It was with fascism that uh, this process expanded, also thanks to the creation of a national imperial heritage centered precisely on Rome. Thanks to massive funds and resources, the ruins of Leptis Magna, Sabrata, and Sirene, you can see here Sabrata, were monumentalized into new archaeological sites, while more generally, the remains of Roman Empire were restored and brutalized. The construction of this national imperial heritage took place not only at the level of patrimonialization, but also at the level of discourse. Through various communicative uh, devices and strategies of vision, the ruins of Rome entered the collective imagery with all their meanings. Written and visual texts produced by propaganda reached different audiences, disseminating the greatness of Romanists and the power of Italian stirpe and race in the Mediterranean. Archaeological photographs circulated in the press. Archaeological films produced by the Instituto Luce were shown in newsreels. Remains were imprinted on illustrated postcards. Cast and status and uh, cast of status and sculptures reached exhibition even far away. The new mass media renewed the significance of the heritage of Italian Libya and the colony, and by being read through the exclusive lens of Romanists. Now, the effect of this phenomenon was twofold. On the one hand, it expanded the boundaries of national belonging redefining Italianness in a Roman imperial dimension. On the other hand, it turned heritage into further instruments of domination. In fact, the creation of the national imperial heritage also passed through the material confiscation of the spaces where the ruins were. People were removed to make room for monumentalized, fenced and exclusive sites. The material confiscation was also realized through the transfer of many artifacts to Rome, especially the most important one, which ended up in various national museums across the peninsula. In both cases, the colonial heritage became the exclusive prerogative of Italians and foreign tourists, and more generally, of those white individuals who could recognize themselves in it. Archaeological remains were transformed in identity mirrors especially for Italians, for both who went to or were taken to the colony by the regime, and for those who remaining at home were nevertheless exposed to their vision thanks to the communicative devices I mentioned. In short, national imperial heritage and Romanists became two key elements in the representation and self-representation of Italianists. Now, what happened to all this with the end of the regime? It is not easy to answer this question because we are in the early days of research, but we can make some reflections starting from artifacts and starting from the perspective of heritage decolonization, which uh, inquires images, discourses, practices constructed and activated through heritage. As I mentioned at the beginning, the analysis of the restitution of colonial materials can be a good approach to the investigation of the process we are talking about. It is not an easy research, mainly because it is difficult to understand the consistencies of these materials. Italy lacks a, a field of study such as provenance research, and museums struggled even to take a census of the objects from former colonies. However, it is possible to analyze the restitution that have already taken place in order to understand the legacies of the process I mentioned and the meaning of the reuse of discourses and images from the past. From this point of view, the public debate that followed the return of the Venus of Siren is an excellent prism to understand this dynamic. Now, what is this Venus there, the so-called Venus of Siren? is a Greco-Roman sculpture which was found by chance by Italian soldiers during the first phase of the conquest of Libya. The sculpture was immediately transferred to Benghazi and brought to Rome in 1915. 
Here, it was placed in the Roman National Museum, one of the most important national collections, and the statue remained there until its return in 2008. During its time in Italy, the artifacts were uh, was used to symbolize certain aspects of Italianness and household. Even before the rise of fascism, the Venus was used by propaganda as a symbol of the epic of return. Eventually, during fascism, the sculpture became an important icon in the visual economy of colonialism. It was reproduced in a series of cast exhibits at the major national and international exhibitions of the time. It was portrayed on postcards and stamps and was used in advertising and satirical cartoons. This statue condensed the values of the regime in terms of power, race, and even gender. As well as being the symbol of the quintessential Roman, the Venus made explicit references to female virtues and whiteness, both used in the racialization process of Italian women, women and undertaken by regime. The discourse that had been tied to her served to evoke all those qualities that made the ideal Italian woman different from the black Venuses of the colonies. Race and lineage became two strong rhetoric cores through which the status spoke the language of the regime. For the Venus, therefore, the transfer to Italy meant a functional resemantization from a political, cultural, and ideological point of view. Decontextualized and recontextualized in Italy, the statue underwent a memorial appropriation and was used to reinforce the sense of national imperial belonging and the identity process associated with the new nation. Now, what happened to this artifact in post fascism In fact, it was neutralized. That means that it was stripped of the meanings it expressed and in some way forgotten. The Venus continued to be displayed in the Roman national museums without explicit reference to its history. The artifact only reappeared in the public debate in 1990s when the question of its restitution emerged. In fact, according to the peace treaty signed by Italy, the statue should have been uh, restituted earlier. But the restitution process was initiated only from the end of the 19th and it provoked an interesting debate that tells us a lot about the Italian colonial archive. What, what were the themes of this debate triggered by the slow restitution procedure? The two most recurring themes in the debate were firstly, the loss of an artifact that was now an integral part of the heritage and culture of the host country. And secondly, the fragmentation of the legacy of classicism preserved in the peninsula. Newspapers, magazines, pundits and commentators exploited these arguments fueling fears of an impoverishment of the entire national heritage. The idea of the risk to which the integrity of the patrimonio nazionale as a whole was subject prevailed, and on this idea, the topic of restitution faded to the advantage of other discourses. One of these was that Italy, was that Italy, not Libya, was the real plundered country. Reviving the ghost of Napoleon and the, and the French plundering, Italy went from being a looting country to a looted country, especially in the, conser in the conservative media and political opinion. In what we can consider a, really, um, a real communication short circuit, the real issue of the restitution to the former colony faded to the advantage of these discourses. In this debate, there were also reoccurring terms, honor, meaning the honor of the Italian nation violated, threatened, undermined by restitution, and weakness or shame, meaning the weakness or shame of a country that compared to others could not assert its right to preserve what had been acquired over time. Those terms were, different, were differently intertwined, shaping the idea of, I quote, an unworthy surrender or a real self-defeat produced by restitution. For instance, in 2007, the newspaper L'Independente provocatively uh, wondered about the restitution. When will the mummies of the Turin Museum be returned to Egypt or the Venetian horses of some march to Turkey? 
What other genuflection will our country have to make to finally feel at easy in the eyes of the world? On closer inspection, this compulsion to return works of art as a profound, uh, as a profound, uh, profound traits of madness. It is not known whether it is due to a bad conscience, national masochism, or collapse of historical consciousness. Now, genuflection, madness, national masochism, uh, collapse of historical consciousness are harsh terms that dramatize the confrontation, making it more and more extreme. Obviously, the debate was not uniform. Some voices went further than others, but in the discussion, there was nevertheless a clear polarization between those who argued for the necessity of restitution and those who instead appealed to a national identity violated by the mere hypothesis of restitution. In this debate, the theme of Romanes was also widely exploited. The statue belonged to Italy because Romanes had first and foremost to do with Italianness and had little to do with Africa in general. As the newspaper wrote, Venus is more pertinent to our artistic context than to the Islamic one. The gender dimension also was broadly recalled. As a conservative newspaper in Messagero wrote, Venus expresses feelings of morality, of love, of meekness, of humanity, of harmony, as they were celebrated by ancient society. These values are in the context of a harmonious and figurative civilization. They are distant and foreign to Islamic culture, which is a culture of non-image, of the secrecy of the body, of the inferiority of woman. Deportation to Libya, and I stress the term deportation, is a gesture without meaning. Now, the racist and misogynist imagery, together with references to Romanness and national honor, highlights a clear continuity of themes typical of the colonial imagery. Among them, we can recognize the difference perceived as subalternity and inferiority, the exaltation of the Italian genius, the greatness of Rome and Romanness, and its strict connection with Italianness. These archives fill the most glaring absence in the restitution debate, that is, the Italy's historical responsibility towards former colonies. References to colonialism are indeed scarce, and when uh, the, colon uh, the colonialism is uh, uh, mentioned, it is done in a rather interesting way. Many voices argued, for example, that the restitution of the statue should be denied and that the artifact should remain in Italy to, and I quote, reward the modernization works carried out by fascists in the African colonies. According to the views, the Venus could be considered as, could be considered as a compensation that the colonies would have to pay to Italy for the infrastructure created by fascism and for the heritage created by archaeology. archaeology. Um, this perception led to, uh, some to, someone to propose a sort of exchange. A campaign, for instance, was launched to exchange the Venus for the two bronze statues of the Fellini brothers. These two statues had been placed on the Fellini arch erected in Libya in 1937 and dismantled by the Libyans as a symbol of fascist rule. For the newspaper Il Tempo, getting the statute back means, I quote, a gesture of reparation for what, uh, for what would be taken away from Italy, the Venus. The statues, in fact, were, I quote, a piece of the history of the Italian presence in Libya and of our 20th century history, so they had to be brought, it has to be brought back to Rome. Rome was to be rewarded for its work of civilization. Again, therefore, a compensation to Italy that could have balanced the loss of Venice. Now, uh, um, I'm mm, sorry, I just want to come back to you. Yes. Uh, in many stances in favor of um, keeping the artifact in Italy, a positive evaluation of fascism prevailed, removing its violence and uh, reinforcing the meat of the good Italians. This meat uh, had already grown since the 1980s, uh, along with the tendency to represent fascism in an apolitical manner, 
and to remodel the memory of colonialism in a self-absorbing manner. The Italians, they said in this debate, had done a good job in the colony, and this good job would be completely repudiated by the return of the Venus to Libya. Now, um, what, what does emerge from these proposals and from this debate? Firstly, the difficulty of coming to terms with the historical responsibility of colonialism. And secondly, a neo-colonial attitude that found in the materials of heritage the possibility of making itself explicit. In the history of the Venus, the widespread and widely shared attempt to remove or critically integrate fascism into the public memory clearly emerged. However, something else also emerged. The scarce capacity to problematize the colonial heritage and the perception of a Romanness that continued to be strongly connoted. Now, since uh, 2008, things have certainly changed, especially in the sense of a greater awareness of the identity and political meaning of, of heritage. Thanks to the pressure coming from international contexts and from civil society, various themes have finally emerged in the Italian public debate. For instance, the identity recognition coming from artifacts, the stories hidden by narratives and monuments of the past, the power of difficult heritage, all these issues uh, now enter into interdisciplinary research on the Italian case for the first time. Certainly there is still much to do, especially in a field such as archaeology, where the discipline seems to be immune to any discussion of its epistemological status. But even in this case, small steps are beginning to be taken and some openness towards the problematization of Romanity seems to be setting in. And I therefore close on a hopeful note with regards to the opening up of new avenues of investigation, which in my opinion cannot fail to be uh, fruitful. Thank you and sorry for this problem with my PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you, Simona. How should we do it? Should uh, the speakers collect a question? Maybe you can comment on yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and also, if you want the speakers to come up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I'm not sure where the camera is in relation to this one or that one. But Simona, we can see. Good. Oh, yeah. It's okay. perfect. I think okay. it's, it's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for those three talks, which um, actually over overlap quite neatly. Um, I've got quite a lot of questions, um, because I think one of the threads through this is museums and archaeology, but also um, the way in which archaeological evidence is um, presented. I mean, I think one of the things that's surprising is the extent to which the material presence of fascism, we know, we know that it's there in the city's of Italy, um, but the extent to which the sort of fascist shaped um, archaeology is also very present. And I think most of us who've gone to archaeological sites in Italy often often see that, like in Ostia, for instance, no, where you can see the kind of interventions mentioned um, by by the by the fascist government. Um, a comment, really. I mean, I've got some questions, but I thought maybe we could start with Simona, and this crosses over a little bit with the other two talks. Is the relationship between archaeology and anthropology um, as disciplines at the end of the 19th century? Um, the very people who are doing the um, kind of measuring of peoples are also part of a kind of broader kind of you know disparate interest in the past and in and, 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 and in the present. So I just wanted to I think that's where I wanted to start was the relationship between anthropology and archaeology because out of you know, out of the invasion comes um, a lot of anthropological material, and that feeds into these archaeological debates. And maybe that explains why archaeologists are also immune is a kind of, if you want, anxiety about the way in which those two disciplines share origins. But to Simona or to, to all of you, I think, because okay. I think it's one of the really interesting things. Because of course, you know, again, I'm not a modernist and early modernist, but I mean, I know that you know, anthropology and archaeology and colonialism are, are kind of 
absolutely tied together. They're very much tied together in the case of the British Empire and the French Empire, but clearly also the Italian Empire as well. And so in some ways, those are threads that are maybe we can kind of look at and, and pull up today. I don't know, Simona or Beatrice or Jan, do you want to start with that? So should I start? Okay. I'll oh, start. Um, they're absolutely related, also because of the digging, <laughs> very, very simply uh, digging, and, and it's also connected like to railways. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, um, Emilia Enare uh, highlighted that um, quite well. The, the digging and the excavations for railways, they're also related, of course, to the, um, uh, the, the uh, archaeological finds and also like uh, Finding bones and skulls, uh, and, and yeah. so on and so forth. So uh, it's it's all part of the same kind of exploration of the soil, and then you have um, the exploring of the surface, which is taking picture, measuring, um, uh, making the the, uh, the the cast, the facial casts that I've, that I've, like the one that I've shown. Yeah. Uh, so you have like two levels, let's say. Of exploration, of spatial explore, exploration, and and then of course you have the musealization. And the interesting thing is that they're not usually in the same spaces, archaeology and anthropology, but they are in the case of the colonial museum. Yeah. So you usually have archaeology museum and you have anthropology museum, but in the case of the colonial museum in Rome, it's all together. It's all mixed together. And you have this just a position of different materials and disciplines, and it's very clear that all of that is uh, colonial science, let's say. So th there is a, a, a huge discussion about what colonial science is, yeah. and I'm not sure I can give an answer, but I would say it's everything. It's everything you want it to be, and, and all the materials together to convey an idea, a colonial idea. Yeah, I mean, what I was thinking about as well, it's really helpful, Beatrice, as well, is about thinking about like collecting practices as well. So, I mean, there was a picture, I think, in your talk of a soldier with a Roman sculpture. Um, and those people who are doing archaeological excavations are also probably collecting ethnographic material as well and putting together stories yeah. about race, which we reach back into antiquity, you know, stories about whiteness and blackness as well. And actually, one of the smaller questions I have, which relates to the bigger political debates that Simona mentioned as well, is um, to what extent are soldiers actually bringing back smaller objects? And what happens to those histories of those much smaller objects, which obviously don't, they're not big Venuses, but don't end up in, in museums? Do you want to start, Simona, with that? or? Well, soldier, uh, soldier for, uh, the, the real subjects of collection, uh, uh, especially in the first part of the colonies, of Italian colonies in Libya, a lot, uh, a lot of them uh, brought back Italy uh, artifacts, sculptures, statues, uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a question that we don't know where all this stuff now is. And um, the problem is uh, that, especially for the first part, for this first part of the uh, Italian conquest of Libya, um, um, uh, artifacts were brought back to Italy without any um, formal dimension. So um, it's quite impossible to to know now where they are. Um, I just want to add something to uh, the question of archaeology anthropology. Archaeologists in, uh, um, in Libya uh, and archaeologists in general in colonial context had also an ethnographic uh, um, uh, gaze. Yeah. So uh, they, they consider the excavators, uh, people uh, um, uh, which uh, uh, dig for them as uh, fossil viventi. Yeah, exactly. uh, so um, there is um, uh, when they, they produce uh, uh, archaeological knowledge, and at the same time they produce ethnographic knowledge, exactly. and then um, there is a, a strict connection that you can uh, um, you you can explore in a very very deep way when you analyze, uh, uh, for instance, the archaeological space, the archaeological field, the archaeological camps, the the place and the space where archaeology. Um, uh, leads. And it's uh, a very um, interesting uh, topic, I think. Uh, these two disciplines are really uh, strictly interconnected, intertwined, especially in this moment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Shall I open it up? Marco. If I can add yes, something on that. Um, 
especially for uh, ethnographic collections, the, the soldiers, and especially for the Second um, Italo Ethiopian War, you have soldiers collecting small objects common, of, of common use um, and bringing them back home or to their, city, to their city in Italy, whatever it is. And they, they usually donate them to Musei Civici. Yeah. So you have a lot of these super small collection, maybe 10 objects, in some unlikely place around <laughs> Italy and in some unlikely museum. Yeah. Like, I don't know, Museo Civico di Legnago. What's that? And you have this, <laughs> this very small, like 10 objects coming from Ethiopia. No one knows nothing about them except that they were donated yeah. by someone that was at the time like kind of a local celebrity coming back from Africa with a small group of objects and, and that's it. So that's interesting. So they're disconnected yeah. from their archaeological context. So they're in some ways absolutely no use for the archaeologists, but then have a broader kind of resonance in a kind of public story about Italy and, and its colonies in Romanita. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, when you were talking about the Museum of, uh, of Colonialism, it, per definition, it's, it's a political subject already, because when you have archaeology, it's not per definition of and, uh, anthropology, neither. Of course, it's always point said that colonialism is, is a political subject, and that's what's interesting. I think before, yeah. uh, during and after fascism, the, 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 the second point was that, uh, yeah. on that of anthropo, how do you call it, uh, the, the, the measuring of the skulls, like, Anthropometric research. Yeah, anthropometric yeah. research. Yeah. You had, uh, I was sitting next to Nicolò, and I said, when I saw the picture, I said, oh, fascists. Uh, oh, Nazis, sorry. <laughs> but yeah. In fact, they all do, of course. Uh, not even even before, of course, fascism and Nazi, because they wanted to create, uh, and that ties in to, with the, the modern uh, thesis I launched, uh, which I copied from somebody else, of course, but it was uh, is the fact that uh, fascism, Nazism, and even before, can be seen as some kind of, uh, uh, they wanted to dominate, the physicality of people as well, not only the, so the, the body of people is very important. It's an anthropological revolution to create a new man, or a new fascist, or a new German. So I think it's interesting to, to try with that uh, as well, and, you know, and not to see it only as an exclusively <coughs> fascist or Nazi event as well. So I remark Nazi from that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm just actually going to say something that reminds me of your talk as well. You spoke about the idea of liberating their buildings and revivifying re them. Um, and I just wanted to know, like, um, is there any archival um, discussions about what happens to the buildings around what's deemed salvageable and not salvageable? So is it, you know, yeah, yeah. do the medieval buildings disappear to the early modern ones? Do they have kind of discussions about the kind of relative value of the different sort of, if you want to have Escape. Yeah, there's lots of debate on this kind of. Much of that has been documented as well, like for uh, for for, for, for Oscar, like it's something I need to speak about. But uh, there were, uh, like La Guadagnina, for example, there were excavations as well. So many of those things uh, were really discussed. In the end, of course, what mattered often was was the critical use of it, but not often, not always. In fact, it was quite some intellectual, really profound debate because we're talking about really. Uh, Logical remain. Yeah. What I showed was the most uh, most obvious politically used uh, excavations, but there was really uh, interesting debate going on before fascism as well. Sure. Right. So it's I mean, it's decisions that archaeologists <coughs> have to make all the time. All whether the time, it's you yeah. know you see, you see these discussions in London about whether it's the 19th century or the medieval or the Roman that they want to. Yeah, when you have uh, like Manacorda, Daniele Manacorda studied. Uh, Archaeologist uh, under fascism, and he had even the classifications of uh, fascist archaeologists, uh, less fascist than the last category was uh, archaeology in last. <laughs> 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 it's, uh, cool. it's a continuous debate between two days, right? Yeah. Okay. Funded by somebody, so that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. I mean, I despair a little bit at the level of the debate in Italian media about this stuff, but it's okay. I have a um, couple of questions for um, Beatrice and a comment for Ian. So the question I have for Beatrice, I mean, I'm, I'm more familiar with Spanish and French colonialism in, in Morocco, and, but, and then um, in the framework of a sort of debt forgiveness um, program, the Italian Development Agency has actually um, 
sort of started this collaboration program between one university in Italy and one university in Morocco to um, uh, preserve um, Roman archaeological site in, in Morocco. So I was wondering whether these kind of initiatives exist in Libya and what assessment you make, you make of that. Uh, the other question I have is, um, I mean, what you're, uh, what you're saying uh, about, you know, Italian, like the path of resistance from um, a lot of entities in Italy to make this, um, to make this, the, the local version of the colonized the museum does not surprise me at all, given, I mean, I was born in 1991 and I was never taught about Italian colonialism um, <coughs> until um, I got to the second year of my master's. Um, so I was wondering whether you can talk about the sort of broader environment of denial that exists in Italy now about these, these things in, uh, in the education field and how, whether this is changing or not, whether there are initiatives, because it seems to me that the country is very far behind, for example, England about this, uh, this kind of story. And um, the comment I had for Ian, sorry, I, I, you, you talked about the Augustium, and I don't know if anyone in this room has uh, ever read um, Eat, Pray, Love by Liz Gilbert. I hope not, but there is, a, a, there is a part where she actually makes this entire thing about the Augustium and how ruin is the road to transformation and something like that. And it's really interesting because she really just briefly mentions Mussolini in that passage. But it's interesting how the Augustium has been romanticized in some, um, yeah, kind of like literature as uh, as a sort of um, paraphrase for romance. So yeah, sorry. Um, there are universities in that are working in Libya, um, but I think maybe Simona can answer that better than me, so I will go to the, uh, your next question and I will leave to Simona uh, to, to comment on this, because yes, there are, and that's problematic as well, but, but Simona will tell you more. Um, so, um, hmm. there is a debate going on, which wasn't the case till a few years ago, so I think um, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement of 2020 and after the uh, homicide of uh, uh, George Floyd, I think partially changed things also in Italy. So the, it's more the debate that before was just academics and that was all. Now it's more, um, it's also more visible, I think. But uh, I mean, maybe we can all discuss about this. But it, but I think that's the case. And there are like uh, uh, film forums and discussion open to the public and the public is actually coming uh, to these events. Of course we're, we're talking about not, not like a huge amount of people but it's already something I'd say and uh, I mean it has also there is uh, I, I think the museum as uh, an object is now felt like something that can be discussed and not just something that's there and we will always be there forever as it is. So there is a discussion going on about the Museo della Civiltà and the, um, it, the, the collection of the former colonial museum of Rome, but also the Anthropology and Ethnology Museum in Florence, which if you ever um, are in Florence, I highly recommend a visit because it's uh, shocking in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's beautiful. It's also, also because it's beautiful, but in uh, other reasons. And, um, but I think there is, there is the start of a discussion now, uh, and it's it's just been a few years, but something uh, definitely changed. But maybe Beth can also <laughs> yeah. comment on that. <laughs> so I live in Florence, and I've been there for about seven years now, and I'm also uh, an activist in black spaces, both in the U.S. and um, in classics and archaeology, but also now in Italy. Um, the difference between pre-George Floyd and post is that now every single time I leave my house and I meet someone new, there it's usually the first time they've ever had the chance to actually have a deep conversation with someone black, let alone a black American, to the level that it's created a kind of social anxiety in me about leaving the house because people want to talk about this all the time. They're not always 
using the kinds of vocabulary that I'm comfortable with. And in fact, they're quite aggressive when I say that I don't want to have this conversation and I'd rather just have a glass of wine tonight, thank you. <laughs> but it is definitely, it, it's something I'm talking about with people every time I leave the house and I'm spending time and space with anyone new. Um, so that has de definitely changed. I mean, one of the things that surprises me, because you were also talking about the museum labels, because in Britain, I mean, um, they're, they're, I mean, and also in some other parts of Europe, they're actually doing different kinds of itineraries within museums and which kind of voices of different communities. So I, I'm surprised that there aren't, for instance, the voices of Libyan, the Libyan community, for instance, in a museum where you've got like alternative stories. There are a few private tours in Florence and Rome and Milan, mm -hmm. um, but they are private tour groups and you have to go searching for them. Mm -hmm. well, not yeah, so well, but it's unfortunate it's not in the museum labels themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not no. that you can't lose the information on one label. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the one in Rhodes, but you could in fact have another itinerary through the museum. I know that I went to a museum in the Netherlands which gave a story of enslavement through what was a kind of Dutch museum of really modern uh, painting. And it was marked out in very, very bright pink, so you could kind of like follow way through it. And also the MA and the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology here has these alternative mm -hmm. itineraries so that there's other voices that are coming through as well. And so a lot of what museums are doing today is trying to engage with communities. I'm surprised not to see that in a kind of national museum, in the Roman museum context. The Museum of Archaeology in Turin um, famously um, <laughs> gave uh, free tickets to um, Arabic speakers, yeah. um, creating a lot of controversy, yeah. a lot of hostility. Yeah. Um, as well, I'm sure, from some Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't hear the last question, but I just want to reply to the first one. Sure. Um, yeah, there are um, several um, mission, archaeological missions, uh, especially from the university, um, Italian archaeological mission in Libya. And the problem is that there is uh, no awareness about the history of archaeology of the, the his, of, of their history. And um, this, this is a problem because uh, when the, uh, the, archeo the Italian archaeology is uh, dig in Italy, they they for the for the large part they didn't re they don't realize what they are doing. <laughs> they don't realize the connection with the past, and they don't realize the um, the strict uh, connection with uh, uh, an ideology that they. Uh, don't question, and this is a problem, of course. Um, I also think that there is a, a one museum that uh, in Italy is uh, going to um, uh, resort his um, mission and his uh, strategies and his uh, Museo Egizio. So it's different from uh, museums we are talking about, but in these museums there are they are trying to uh, to make a different work and to, to discuss the question of inclusion uh, in, a, in a very clever way. But I, I agree that uh, archaeological museums uh, in Italy continue to be very conservative. There's a re Thank you, Simone. In fact, that was mentioned in Museo Gizio, um, just in the com comments. I mean, there's been a recent exhibition in the Louvre, um, which included archaeological material related to uh, ancient Egypt, which included a black African kingdom. And actually, they had within the exhibition a whole section on um, archaeology and colonial archaeology as well. So, in a sense, that's one way through which you can represent and resignify re these objects is through the story of their excavation. And in this case, in the Italian case, you've got war and violence that kind of underlines those excavations as well. Yeah, and you had a question. Sorry, there was a question for you, Yeah, No, uh, no more, more for the marks. So okay. Kind of answer, okay. By the book. Fine, go ahead. I'm in there. Hi, thanks so much for all your papers. Um, one thing that struck me was how throughout all the papers there's this tension between continuity of either fascism as a continuation of project of Ita Italianification, but also Italian imperialism being a Roman return. Um, but I was also struck by the representations of um, North Africans as both living fossils, but then also the Arab 
the, the spread of Islam in North, North Africa being a destructive tide that washes mm -hmm. away and destroys the uh, Roman heritage of the, re of the region. Um, so, um, and the, another thing that uh, I found really interesting was the representation of the return of the Venus of Cyrene being a deportation, <coughs> and obviously this coming within the context of Italian anxieties around migration from North Africa to to Italy and the, the, the deportations of real people. So I suppose my question is, um, how do you make sense of this contradiction? And also, um, in terms of the anthropology in North Africa, um, how is the sense of this being a continuation of sort of Southern Christian anthropology talked about uh, in the anthropology of North Africa, whether that's a concern for the anthropologists? Mm -hmm. um, and um, whether there's any trace of Libyan reception or Libyan encounters with either Italian anthropology or um, whether they were even the intended audiences of museums, whether you had Libyan visitors to museums and also, I suppose, the post-colonial histories of museums. So, sorry, that was kind of a jumble of those points. So, still some continuity, continuity in rupture, Libyan encounters with anthropology and museology, um, and also, I suppose, the, the how, um, yeah, that's it. Simona, would you like to start or should I start? Oh, did you hear Simona? Yeah, I, I didn't hear her very well, but uh, um, I, I think I, I, I got the question. Uh, well, in Italy there is this uh, big contradiction uh, um, in relation of uh, heritage and colonial heritage because uh, um, I said that the only museums that try to, to do a different work is the uh, museums uh, uh, at Turin. But uh, there is uh, um, um, no connection, uh, so no discussion uh, about uh, uh, the question of uh, hidden communities, and in this case of Libyan communities. Uh, Libyan communities that uh, is uh, a community uh, eradicated, rooted in Italy, but um, there is no perception of uh, uh, the strategies that um, heritage could promote now for integration or inclusion of this community. I don't know I, I, if, I, if I grasped the question because I didn't hear very well, but uh, perhaps um, it could be um, an answer. Um, so, uh, uh, about the encounters with the anthropologists, um, that would be actually very interesting, and I don't have any evidence of this. Um, uh, what it is interesting is what happens in Libya after the Italians are officially gone. So, of course, the museums are there, so it's interesting to note what they do after the Italians are gone. Of course, there is still a huge presence of Italian, especially in Tripoli, uh, until uh, Gaddafi is. Uh, comes to power, so you have these, um, you know, 15 years where the directors of the museums are still Italian, the curators are Italians, and and later, what you have later, it's Gaddafi that comes to power and has to manage those museums that are in very colonial still, and what he does uh, with the, also with the Islamic uh, heritage, so a kind of... Um, the, the, uh, the idea that heritage is just Roman heritage, it's not, no longer what the Museum of Gaddafi's era tries to convey, but there is a layering. So of course the Roman heritage is still there, but then you have the Islamic period, you have the Phoenicians, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so I don't have evidence of the, the, about the encounters of uh, the anthropologists and the, archaeologi the archaeologists with the um, Libyan people at the time. I don't know if maybe Simona has can add something on this, but uh, it is interesting to notice what they do with this heritage after when the Italians are gone, um, and and that yes, okay, it can be studied. Yes, when the Italian went on or not, the, um, the there was the, um, a completely. Uh, Obscuration of the, I don't know how to say, but uh, uh, Romanity was completely uh, fed out, fed away. And um, uh, the only uh, uh, 
there was a change, uh, a big change when uh, um, these uh, uh, big archaeological sites, uh, uh, Leptismania and Sebrada, uh, was uh, transformed in uh, UNESCO sites. And uh, the, it's, a, it's a field to be studied because uh, uh, in this change you can see a different approach uh, by Libyans to the uh, archaeological Roman sites. Uh, they understood that uh, for tourism, uh, these archaeological sites were a, a really important course, and so they tried to exploit it, all this heritage that for the first time of the uh, new uh, regime uh, was indeed completely um, uh, misunderstood. Actually, in relation to Romanita, I mean, if you talk to a classicist, I don't know if there are other classicists in the room, they, they would say that it's easy to decolonize uh, classicism. So in some ways, because actually, if you look at the Roman Empire, it's with the legacy of the Roman, the Roman world, it's the way in which the Roman world has been interpreted um, from the Middle Ages or from the Renaissance. Um, and, and so, in fact, one of the things you might want to think about, what the, I mean, I'm sure that classicists and archaeologists hopefully are talking to each other, the extent to which that decolonized classics Canon can then kind of feed into kind of reinterpretation of architectural remains, for instance, or archaeological remains. Yeah, but it's a, but it's a, it's a very open debate as well. And, and, and these, uh, in those disciplines, uh, in classics, you have all these threads on, on the internet on exactly that kind, yeah. of, kind of subject. It's a, it's a free line that cuts in with the whole woke debate as well, mm -hmm. uh, which you can indulge in now. It's, it's everywhere and it's every day, it's nothing and everything. The right wing parties are talking about woke for everything, and it's going on. It's the same, which is uh, the question of, of the past and what we did and what we're doing now with the past. I uh, remember, really, of course, in the classics, but in many kind of uh, that's more of a general reflection, but it's, it's really it shows the importance of this, this, this conference as well, I think, which is really speaking about what, what we do today, not, not about what we did before, <laughs> uh, in some sense. Mary. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to ask uh, Jan um, where the church gets into this mm -hmm. scheme. Um, and partly because you, you showed those photos of, is it, is it called St. Peter and St. Paul, that church? Um, yeah. yeah, the one in, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so you've got this, you've got this kind of um, <coughs> scheme that you know, we can all get our heads around with, with the kind of nexus of fascism and classical um, antiquity. But then also somehow you have to insert the Catholic Church, which kind of jars, perhaps, in some ways, ideologically as well as aesthetically, <laughs> architecturally. Um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm a Renaissance Italian uh, historian, of course, we're having to deal with that question all the time, you know, how with this revival of classicism, where does the church fit in? Uh, so I wondered if you could um, address that. Yeah, that, that was a question which was really at the uh, Harvard debate, and you see, you see the money, it was because it really. Uh, as, as, as a symbol of there, it's yeah. there was a, as an eagle and, and then a cross, so that everything is said in just one image. Uh, <laughs> but of course, in the rest of Romanita culture, it was, it was not only uh, not always really central. What what we know is that in Italian society, when you look at, um, but I studied that because I saw I interpret fascism as a political religion. So I was wondering what's up with traditional religion, and then you see that, that there was uh, quite some quite some some opposition as well, that the people try to, 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 to manage both as forces in society. So uh, in the case of Romanita, um, it was not, not always much uh, under the score that there was a continuity with the Catholic uh, world, uh, but there was no opposition as well because Catholic Rome was present and uh, we had some fascist uh, hierarchy who were really opposed to, to, to incorporating, to incorporating uh, Catholicism, but most uh, just uh, had to accept it. So, Physically, it is the center of the Roman Empire, but also the center of Catholicism. So physically, it's present, so you can't deny it. And uh, that's why, as well, apart from other uh, simply political reasons, in 29, you had the, the conciliation between the Italian, the Italian state and the Vatican, which was really a historical fact, uh, and, and, and a conflict between, uh, between uh, Italy, not only fascism, but the fascist regime, well known, of course, as, as a history. But uh, in, the, in the context of Romanità, the, the, this uh, Catholic uh, aspect was not um, 
not omnipresent at all. No, and then it was uh, like when you when you're talking about, for example, in 22 of uh, Virgin, uh, you had the Lady Gaga, the Bad Lady, sorry, I forget uh, <laughs> the uh, hand problem. Uh, in 22, there was the, the celebration of uh, Virgin, this uh, Lady Gaga, the Bad Lady Gaga celebration, the the for the, the, the poor idea of uh, which was maybe uh, the idea of Jesus and Christ. Uh, was now and then uh, put to the front as uh, as being uh, central element, and important element, but it was not central to the whole the whole thing. So they tried to 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 engage in dialogue and to interpret and incorporate uh, some elements. Uh, that was it's, it's good. there was a tension, but there was also quite uh, quite some quite some uh, some bon entente. Ahead. Um, yes. So thank you for the, for the speech and building up on that question. I wanted to know more about the role of the Islam as religion has in all of this. Yeah, Dr. Um, Fakuchi briefly mentioned this um, um, this antagonistic, this idea that the inhabitants of the Roman Empire in Libya were celebrated while the current inhabitants of Libya were considered inferior and the inferior. And also Dr. Troilo, you mentioned something about um, the fact that the um, a statue of Venus was not should not be um, given to Libya and, and again because of the because of Islam and religious reasons. So could you expand more on the role of religion in Islam in all this? And how the perception of antagonism with Islam is was perceived in an architecture and, and archaeology as well? Should I start? Would you like to start Simona? Okay, then I will go ahead. Okay, so I, I don't think actually it's a matter of religion uh, at all. <laughs> it's really just, um, uh, you know, an escamotage to, to, to say that's the basis of it. But I will give you an example that it's something that I actually wanted to add in my presentation and I didn't have time, but I'm happy to talk about it now. Okay, so I said that um, Septimius Severus was you know, referred to as uh, the, the emperor who founded Black Tismania and brought it to its splendor, so was celebrated as Roman, fully Roman emperor, even if he was from Black Tismania, but he was considered to be a fully Roman emperor and actually one of the, uh, let's say, a, a living proof of the fact that there was this connection. Uh, until 1938. What happens in 1938? In 1938 you have the Russian laws in Italy, and you have Giorgio Almirante, which some of you might know as a, a leader of one of the right, the right wing, extreme right wing party during the Republican times in Italy, so after the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, which call, was called Movimento Sociale Italiano MSC, MSI. Um, uh, and uh, Giorgio Almirante in 1938 writes on La Difesa della Razza, which was this publication uh, entirely based on racism and trying to explain racism to the Italians. Uh, and uh, 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 that um, Septimius Severus wasn't a Roman emperor. And the reason was that he was a um, uh, Phoenician. And the Phoenician, just like the Jews, are a Semitic people. So, um, and his son Caracalla, which I have no idea how it translates in English, Caracalla? Okay, fantastic. So Caracalla, eh, eh, and with his um, famous Edicto di Caracalla, so his famous new law for the citizenship of the empire, opened the citizenship, the Roman citizenship to all the peoples of the empire. And what Almirante says is that from there you can see the, the, the starting of the decadence of Rome. So not it's not just that Septimius Sever is not uh, a Roman emperor, it's that his son um, is the, co the main cause of the decadence of the Roman Empire. So you can see very clearly that it's, it's just, uh, um, I mean, this idea of race and also religion, in my opinion, it's, it's just something that it, it's, it gets used in different terms, even during the same fascist period. Um, and I'm sure Simona would like to add something on this. Yes, there's a question. It's a question of manipulation. It's continuous manipulation of terms of uh, 
period of times of uh, religious elements and uh, uh, for instance uh, in Libya all the um, Islamic uh, uh, buildings on ruins were completely, especially in the first time, were completely ignored by fascists because uh, Romaniki reabsorbed everything and uh, um, the elements of uh, Islamic culture were um, uh, emphasized only when they became uh, um, something interesting for the um, touristic development. So um, it, it, it permits um, um, uh, a, a new manipulation of this kind of, uh, uh, of object or art. But, and uh, uh, the question is the romantic uh, uh, is really the, the central core and everything could be absorbed in this um, in this core, and this course could change like the Cetina Severi discos changes. It's Thanks. So I had a question. It's a little bit follows on from what we just asked about con the contestation within fascism. Um, yeah, and your quote: Botai is always doing this, right? He's they're fighting internal battles within the regime. So he talks about uh, uh, contro il parere dei metodici nemici della cultura che godono di un certo favore. In other words, he's fighting for, uh, I don't know, the prestige, the sort of fascist recognition of the centrality of culture, that's kind of vague term. Um, and I'm wondering if, if this kind of is encountered in, in all these different fields. In other words, is there kind of uh, tactical competition for resources, say, you know, support archaeology, support um, museums, as opposed to perhaps Almirante was kind of pretty much kind of anti everything, but also anti culture, right? He just was uh, sort of sort of turned towards violence and kind of force of the state and a, a different model of fascism. So, how does that kind of internal contestation within fascism play out in these uh, different disciplines or different cultural sectors that you're you're expert in? Yeah, it's a uh, but. It's like a, it's, it's more of a, of a micro history of, of, of these uh, these internal debates, in fact, which uh, which still has to be undertaken, I think, because uh, many studies uh, are quite general about, of course, the link uh, reception of the to Roman imperial grandeur. But when you look at, for example, when the, there was a question about uh, about archaeology, when I uh, talked about uh, spoke about, uh, for example, the Lagra Argentina, which was excavated, also in these contexts, you had the uh, business went on as usual as well. I mean, there was really serious intellectual debate, but there was this political uh, political influence, which was all, were always explicitly uh, expressed as well. So we have to, to go and look, uh, for example, where people come from, uh, people like uh, Botai as a politician, uh, archaeologists, and etc. You don't always uh, literally see uh, political, uh, political uh, arguments, um, but you know it's behind when, when you go to look, go look at, at, at where people come from, from which, uh, for example, which uh, in Italy, uh, you always tend to speak uh, from the La Scuola, which is the school of mm. some professor, which is uh, quite uh, different from, from other uh, intellectual academic contexts. So, uh, when you look at these scholars, you have, uh, for example, some, some like Ettore Tais, who's an ancient historian, but you also have uh, like, uh, like Croce, which is, of course, not, not, not a much bigger figure in, in, the, in a more general sense. But so, so, all these things have to be taken into account, and, and there's, there's it's not always uh, very explicitly uh, explained, so that's uh, that those things should I think should be added and should be studied in, in order to, to be able to map this intellectual field, intellectual and political field, and the way in which um, there's a continuous, continuous uh, negotiation uh, surrounding antiquity uh, and the way in which it is uh, it's studied, it's used, so say abused, but in terms of in our scientific context. Well, that's, that's more or less the yeah, Building on that uh, La Scuola D, mm -hmm. um, I could add something about the anthropologists that I, that I mentioned in my presentation. <coughs> and both Nello Puccioni and Lidia Cipriani, they belong to the School of Anthropology of Florence uh, of Paolo Mantegazza, so it's very important. And uh, what's interesting to note is that Puccioni is actually uh, an anthropologist well before fascism. So he goes to Somalia in 1913 and he, he travels and works before fascism. When fascism, fascism comes up, 
is, I would say, totally unbothered. I don't know if it was truly a fascist or not, but it just he's invited to go to Cirenaica by the governor, and he goes to Cirenaica and he does the measurements and the anthropologic mission. And there is no, no issue at all about this. And on the other hand, Lidia Cipriani, he was very engaged in the Russian laws and uh, the manifesto uh, della, uh, della Razza. But again, there is this, he's in total contrast with some other anthrop fascist anthropologists, and he's one of the very few uh, scholars that doesn't return to university after uh, uh, the, the, the Italy loses the war and during the Republic. So he's one of the very few, and the reason, it's not that because he was a fascist and because he was one of the ideators of the Manifesto della Razza, but it's because of like m money issues, let's say, mm -hmm. how it did some mm, shady things with uh, university money. So the reason it's not because he was a fascist or because he was the most important uh, anthropologist of fascism. So you have this school, la scuola di thing, and you have the contrast, which are not always political. Maybe they're just, they don't like each other. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, just um, thinking about the purpose of, of, a, of a day of this kind, and indeed the purpose of, uh, of uh, interventions of, uh, of the kind that you make, is that we're looking at the past, but at the same time, of course, you're exploring a series of concepts and using the past to, 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 to become more conscious of the way in which those concepts operate. One of the things, words that, and concepts that recur in throughout the three talks is that of myth. Um, and it, it's interesting to sort of think about the typology of myth that's emerging, also from the extremely striking visual information that's conveyed. So there are different ideas of myths coming across. One is myth as an agent towards future change, very strongly. Another a, a sort of Bartian notion of myth is, is that it ensures stasis. A third is the way in which it works as a vehicle between the natural and the supernatural. All of these things seem to be present. Um, and part of taking Gan's earlier point, Part of this is that it allows us to think about the way in which mythological structures are very much operating in our world through um, all kinds of geopolitical e examples. So I suppose the question in there, or, is, or observation, is really, it is about, what, one of the things that study of this period is about is working towards an enhanced typology of the meaning of myth and mythological structures, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a... Uh, when I talk about, talk about phantasm as well, and uh, link it to, to myth as well, because it's one of the categories which, which you mentioned in a certain sense of, of, of mythological uh, thinking, and uh, you spoke about Bart, Bart as well. Uh, myth can, of course, be linked to, to in, in really the pregnant, the pregnant sense, and I don't know if it's in English, but to, to discourse, mythos, the world, it's, it's the histories that, that, that are created, that are surrounded, surrounded us, and that can be. That can, how do you, how do you say? that can be used in a religious sense, uh, but also in a more, uh, a, a more uh, practically applied sense, uh, linked to, for example, uh, identity, who we are. And, and I think it's, it's, it's something that speaks about today as much as does, but as about the, does it about the past, if I'm really making myself a bit clear. <laughs> it's, it's a very, um, it's, like, it's like the whole debate on. on Woke debates. Um, I speak for, I spoke of you know, this whole conference in itself, uh, as you said. It, it's, it's interesting, as I think, uh, in this context, uh, maybe what I put this aspect. I'm, not sure. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the justification of a, um, a political position nowadays, and how in my last slide you had the Italian Coloniale website, which is, and, and there are also like Facebook pages related to it, but a number, like 10 different Facebook pages, and it's all managed by the same person that like, constantly, every day, shares facts of Italian about Italian colonialism, and I think it's kind of, I mean, that a, a psychologist would have like something to say, like, uh, <laughs> not really, because I think it's, it, it's really, um, it's very profound, a very profound um, I don't know, like feeling that this person has towards the colonial empire uh, of, of yeah, really, 
and he's, he's like trying really to find a justification for, in my opinion, for his political standing of today. There. So in this sense, um, the myth is what is building, constantly building. He and the people that are working with him, uh, constantly building. Uh, but I think it's very much related to where he stands today, and they stand today. I just see Mona wants to. Uh, I think rather than saying woke, I would just say culture wars, maybe, mm -hmm. just because it's been instrumentalized in ways that aren't very nice. Yeah. That would, I mean, that, yeah, I don't know whether that's a fair <laughs> point. <laughs> but go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, I really enjoyed those papers. I, I thought they were great. And that sense of, of, of us as academics slowly but steadily wrestling with these issues and moving forward you know, is. is I think it's tremendous because 20, 30 years ago this stuff was, was two or three people really doing this and so this is really good progress I think. Uh, I've got one interesting, well one point to make, it's a question and I'm working on the Italian geographers in that particular period, in the 1930s and how they were engaged with the conceptualizations of space and territory and colonial territory and indeed their sense, they had a sense of working within a colonial science and I thought of, I wrote about this once, I can't remember what I said about it because I'm not old and Tired. But nevertheless, the, I, had, I, I didn't think of the, the, there was a sense then of people trying to articulate what a colonial science was. And what I'm finding in the archival stuff I'm doing at the moment is the Italians, the geographers, uh, doing those surveys in the early 1930s of the Libyan interior, uh, being really well organised and very spectacularly modern in all kinds of ways in terms of like image rights, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, strategies for releasing information and so on and so forth. Which was, which was very striking. So I wasn't expecting to find that whatsoever. I mean, partly because these people are academics, they dis disregard the rules and they don't do what they're told. And, they, and uh, Tipidani, for example, goes off and sells all these pictures to the newspapers and the image rights belong to the, to the regime or whatever. But nevertheless, there's, there's an interesting process there, I think, of modernization in the field that I'm looking at. So I'm wondering if, because we talk, you've talked about various individual collectors, various small groups getting information, taking, bringing back our photographs, bringing back uh, artefacts. Was there a sense of modernisation of this process taking place at any point? It, to me, it seems to be 1928 to the early 1930s. And I don't know whether you're finding that in any of your work. It's not in my, my, not in the field of, uh, of uh, colonial studies, really, but that uh, when you see, for example, it's just an example of the Institute of Studio Line, uh, was a really very, very modern institution uh, in the way of organizing culture, and that was something in general which was very well done. Well done, I mean, not in a very uh, sci scientifically well, uh, not just like sending pictures to. to Newspapers, but there was really archives uh, which were really uh, treated like like uh, like treasures, for example. And the, the way in which uh, academic research culture was organized by this institution was, was really uh, in a very effective manner as well, which is, was quite new for for Italy at that time. Uh, so that that's been studied in, in in this way. That's just a general remark on on Romanian culture and the Institute of Romania, but it was really uh, the institution which. Uh, which was founded not by the fascist regime, but really by this person, Nazi Palizzi. So the regime used, of course, and, and inserted itself into this institution, but it came from, from below. Like one person who surrounded himself by other people. Uh, it was not an academic in any way, so it's not, I'm not really speaking about, uh, for example, geographers, or uh, I'm speaking about uh, an institution which was born just before and during the fascism, and which uh, acted in a very modern sense and organized cultural and academic research as well. Maybe uh, another fields. Uh, um, from the point of view of the Ministry of the Colonies, I would say that there is a attempt at centralization. So all the objects and pictures and also movies would go <coughs> to Rome. And from there, um, newspapers, magazines, other museums could request them. They would get them, but uh, after, um, uh, let's say, at, at the beginning, starting from the, the um, 18, uh, 80s, 
you have so many different museums and so many different uh, like missionaries and soldiers and ethnographers and travelers uh, collecting stuff quite randomly. So what they, what I can see from the the, the end of the twenties is this attempt, which I don't think fully was fully successful, but it was an attempt. Thank you. I don't know if Simona wants to add something. No, sorry, but I lost the connection, so I, I really couldn't hear what uh, what you asked. Sorry. Do you want to ask? It was just a question about was there a, a systemized, systematized, professionalized approach which emerged at any point it, that you have a sense of from the, the, the archives and materials you've been looking at. Uh, so it wasn't just individual collectors, it wasn't just individual explorers or individual surveyors. It was, it was a collective attempt to, to manage, produce and manage information. Well, for, for, uh, I think that for archaeology there is a, a lot to do in terms of research because uh, um, uh, archae archaeological practice and archaeological profession um, are uh, um, analyzed especially uh, by archaeologists and inside the discipline. So uh, historians are now trying to um, uh, to go deeper in question of uh, the professionalization and also uh, in the question of the uh, professionalization in terms of colonialism. And I think that is a, a field that uh, needs uh, more and more inquiries. So as it, it could be that in future uh, we could, uh, we could uh, get a, a deeper knowledge about the uh, different stages and the different modalities through which uh, uh, colonialism um, uh, impacted on the professionalization of archaeology. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No, that was a long, that was a <laughs> discussion. <laughs> uh, thanks to Marco for leaving so much time for that. And thank you, Simona, for your patience. I hope that you thank, most thank, of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Sorry for all these problems. Yeah, no, no. Uh, you did amazingly well, so thank you. I mean, I mean, I have a lot of questions left. I mean, um, that I don't think that any of us necessarily um, can answer. I mean, I think the history of archaeology and the history of anthropology, obviously, is one of them. I mean, I think the question about Islam <laughs> feels to me like it. There is, and in Christianity as well, because there are foils in Christianity in relation to fascism. You talk about these public or uh, these state religions, but of course, Christianity is part of the story of fascism, and that one of the perfect foils in most of their histories is, is one, or, one or the other. And of course, what happens to Oriental studies in this period? I mean, probably there's a PhD somewhere, but what happens to Oriental studies in this period um, would be kind of one of the questions that I had. Um, and then just going back to where I started, which is about the memories of, um, I mean, it's clear that this colonial past has a, it's still uh, a very kind of, has a very kind of vibrant life and is fed partly by the, politics of the culture wars, it sounds like to me. Um, but it would be interesting to kind of do, and I've just sent um, Gianmarco an article that he knows about, Chris Jefferson's article, about the uh, artifacts that are collected by colonial administrators in Britain, in Africa, and what happens to them in a kind of domestic context. So on the one hand, I appreciate the point about professionalization, but on the other hand, I'm thinking like, what's actually happening in people's homes, like what happens to those objects, and how does intergenerationally that memory kind of continue. Uh, to today. And then finally, you know, the Libyans and Africans who live in, in, in Italy today and where their voices as well, so where their voices are. So thank you. Um, I think that's the end of this session. Yes, so thank you to the speakers. <laughs>